Hello, good morning. Welcome to Join News. That's good. Coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Limne. Coming up this morning, danger looms as lack of space compromises quality health care at the Komfa Nochi Teaching Hospital. There has never been any comprehensive renovation of the hospital. Mm -hmm. The best part is constant use. As Joy News checks reveal, some emergency patients receive treatment on the floor. Also this morning, management of the National Identification Authority declares its inability to fulfill requests made by staff regarding their conditions of service. Well, there's a response coming from the NHIA boss. Uh, he'll be joining us in this uh, bulletin. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Please stay for details. Lack of adequate space is compromising the quality of health care at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. Data from the National Ambulance Service suggests the hospital receives more emergency cases than any other hospital in the country. Meanwhile, Joy News checks suggest wards at the Accident and Emergency Center designed to accommodate 12 patients on the average houses over 40 patients now with some receiving treatment on the floor. The head of public relations at the facility, Kwame Frimpon, says until recently, resources are improved, quality health care cannot be guaranteed. Next the hospital will be 70 years since it started operating. This is a hospital that was built for less than 500 beds, mm -hmm. and we are now counting about 1,200. The same space, but the beds have increased. So the hospitals had a dual problem. Problem with age, because naturally, when you put up a structure for 70 years, if you don't do anything at all to it, it will still deteriorate. So in the last seven there has not been any kind of there has never rehabilitation? Been, never been any comprehensive Re renovation of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Best part is constant use. I've told you about the numbers in terms of best, the progression that we've recorded mm -hmm. over the years. For 500, we are now heading around 1,200, 1,300. Mm -hmm. What has happened is that we've rather compressed the utilization of the space. So instead of an area where we will usually put a bed, we are now putting two. If you're supposed to put 10 beds, you are now putting 20. And it's all because the hospital has not seen any expansion. So overutilization has also taken a very heavy toll. Ashanti region has been over the years one of the most populous regions. In fact, it was one of the it was the leading or the most populous region in Ghana mm -hmm. until the 2020 uh, operation census Popul yes. when Greater Accra uh, came at par. Mm. Now, Kofrochi has remained the only hospital all these years. All the uh, programs that were intended to expand the infrastructure never succeeded. Mm -hmm. A typical example is the Matenja Children's Block, 950 bed, for 47 years. We couldn't even finish it. Way back in 1976, they realized that the catchment area of, of the hospital was expanding and the clientele base was also growing, so there was a need to expand the facilities. Fortunately, we never had that benefit. With the existing infrastructure, we've been compelled to use it for the same population that may be twice the space that we are using now. Well, I've been joined by the head of public relations at the Kwame Nkrumah uh, uh, K, uh, Kath, Konfanochi Teaching Hospital, I beg your pardon, Kwame Frimpong, he has more on this. Mr. Kwame Frimpong, I'm grateful for your time. Now, I, I need you to paint a picture of what exactly we are dealing with in terms of space at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. Hello, Mr. Kwame Frimpong. That, it is said that uh, hospitals have uh, a no bear syndrome. But at CAT, it's more of a no space syndrome. This hospital was constructed 70 years ago for a specific population size. The population has increased over the years, but the infrastructure has remained the same. Regrettably, unlike Greater Accra, where there are complementary or ancillary facilities to help Kolebu, for instance, if you come to Ashanti region, you don't have that same situation existing. So CAT has remained the sole tertiary facility for all this while, and all the cases are ended up here. So it is a very common sight to see very congested um, uh, uh, walls when you come to the Asian Emergency Center, for instance. 
And as I indicated the last time, if you go to the orange, which was built for 12, we now have about 40, 42 beds with patients. All the beds are fully occupied. So imagine a space that was built for 12, but we've managed to procure beds and add it to the same space. So we come to the hospital where a bed was supposed to be. We, 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 we count up to two or three. And in this classic example of orange, we may count up to four with space that was supposed to take just a bed or two. So Conformity Team Hospital is actually in that need of expansion, in that need of modernization, uh, because the pressure is said that even our equipment we keep breaking down around the clock. If you should come to the Western Emergency Center now, or virtually all the special beds that are being used for patient care needs replacement. All the beds must be replaced and the same goes before that facility, the ventilators, for patient monitors, and so because there's so much pressure on us. You know, we are about the most accessible hospital in Ghana, given our location uh, in this part of the country. And so we receive a lot of cases. In fact, from our records, up to 12 regions. All the regions that are surrounded, it's easier for them to get to us than to go to, for instance, Accra. And so there's a lot of pressure on this hospital, but regrettably, uh, we've not had the benefit of uh, any expansion or comprehensive renovation over the years, and that is one of the major causes of the congestion that we are witnessing at the hospital. Right and now. aside the issue of space, definitely there are other issues we are having to deal with. Recently, we heard about uh, lack of machines for dialysis treatment and all of that. Yeah, that is true. There is a comprehensive uh, plan to um, rectify that uh, situation. But we need a lot of support from the state because dialysis machines and running dialysis services, these are very expensive ventures. Um, we have currently signed a contract for the supply of three new dialysis uh, in addition to six months of consumables. And that is costing us in the region of 1.6 million. Now, when we do some of these arrangements and the funding source is really that, a social one, the commercial one, and we have a very uh, suppressed way of setting tariffs in this country when we're a public hospital. It can be very difficult for us to get the money to pay back this investment that we are making. That is one of the reasons why uh, when we come here, we, we, we are unable to replace some of the equipment that break down after we've used them over the years to provide them. Because the tariff structure has said that you may only be able to recover the cost of operations and, and then maybe the cost of maintenance, but not necessarily the cost of uh, replacement which is very expensive. We are doing a comprehensive innovation and expansion of our Dallas Center. So we close the whole Dallas Center down. By the end of the month, we should be ready to start operating it. We are expecting the new Dallas machines to be in country by the end of the month, and hopefully by the first part of April, we should have these new machines uh, uh, operational. We now have the capacity to double the existing uh, space that we have and that is going to give us the opportunity to uh, stock in excess of about uh, 16 machines. We already have two in the system. Recently, Springfield gave us two refurbished ones. And so that will be up to seven. And we still think that uh, we will need public support in terms of new machines so that we can deliver quality services to uh, kidney patients who come to the hospital. Uh, back to the issue go, of, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, um, I, I was trying to say that uh, this country has a certain policy, and the policy is that issues of uh, capital expenditure, our capital investment, are that of the state. And so, for instance, this equipment shouldn't have been bought by us because it is a commercial arrangement, and therefore we need a certain tariff structure to be able to recover uh, fully. Now, if we have to go that way, then it means that the tariff structure will have to be changed. Unfortunately, we are not in control of that. It's the state that sets the structure. Now, if you don't do a lot more social funding of these uh, acquisitions, by the time it comes, we will not be able to maintain even the one that we have now, because we will not be generating enough to pay for the consumables, to pay for maintenance, and eventually, when they break down, to pay for uh, replacement. And especially with regards to the uh, issue of congestion, which you alluded to earlier, have you lodged any complaint? And if you have, what has the health ministry done about this so far? Uh, for the health ministry's own records, the is the least 
served in terms of health infrastructure. That is not in doubt. It's, it's something that has been known for years. We have very few purpose-built hospitals in this region, even though for decades it was the most populous region. And so they know that when we have issues in terms of numbers, we have issues in terms of sizes, and we have issues in terms of capacity. We always say that Kofrat is a thousand two hundred bed. Its counterpart in the greater Accra is Kulibu. Kulibu is about fifty percent bigger than Kofrat. Now, Tech, Tech or Kenya City Hospital has about one hundred beds. Its counterpart in Accra is a UGMC. It has over four hundred beds. If you go to the Kumasi South Hospital, which is the acting, because we don't have a regional hospital, the most populous region in Ghana, and yet we don't have a regional hospital. Kumasi South Hospital, which is the acting regional hospital, has one hundred forty beds. This is the counterpart in Accra, rate has almost four hundred beds. So the, these are the data that is available, which has been available for years, and the ministry and the authorities are in the known. And, 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 and so if it is happening, it's not for, for lack of knowledge or awareness. It is simply a question of uh, uh, disparities in the infrastructure development so as far as the health sector is concerned in this country. So how do you intend to resolve this issue now that uh, the ministry hasn't really done anything about it? Are you going to sit down and uh, fold your arms? No, and, and, and that is one of the reasons why we are doing so with the advocacy we are doing it now. Because it is, it, is, it is impacting negatively even on our image. People expect Kofanoche to be in a position to admit ad infinitum. They think that we have infinite capacity to admit. And so when they come here and the place is full, it is, it is the hospital that they blame and not the disparities in the healthcare infrastructure that we are experiencing in this country. And so it is even in the interest of the hospital to do this advocacy, and that's why we've done over the years. On our own, I've told you that we are optimizing the use of the existing space that we have. And that's how come, if you come to the Orange, for instance, a 12-bed capacity, we now have 40, 42 beds, because we've compressed the use of the space in order to allow for more beds to be uh, uh, placed in these areas. We believe that it is about time the region startup and, and make sure that the upcoming facilities like the Kumeru and the Sewa Regional Hospital, the ferries and the rest, we, we, we try as much as possible to impress upon the state to complete those facilities so that we take some of the pressure of us. Since I joined this hospital in 2005, we've had a number of CEOs, but each of them have has always resisted the temptation to close down this hospital when it is full, because they think that you are giving the people who are coming here no option, because there's no alternative. So on our own, we've tried to soak up the pressure, but it is, it's, it's reached a point where we are putting too much stress on our staff, too much stress on existing facilities, and, and they keep breaking down, and it is becoming a problem. And well, so we are hoping that as we do, the best that we can by optimizing the existing facilities to deliver the best of service. There is the urgent need for this country to take a critical look at health infrastructure in the Shantri region and, and make sure that uh, once you get the needed help that it needs. Thankfully, I've been joined also by the ranking member on the health committee, Kwabena Minta Akando. Mr. Kando, your committee is supposed to ensure that health facilities are in good shape. So what have you been doing all this while? Hello, Mr. Kando. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll, let, let me try once again to get to your attention. Minta Akando, who is the ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament. Mr. Akando, your job as a committee is to ensure some of these health facilities are in good shape. What has your committee been doing all this while to get to the point where Konfanochi Teaching Hospital is in this shape? All right, we'll try and get him back on the line. Uh, 
to uh, speak to the issues. But let's take, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kwame Frimpong. He is the PRO of CAT. He's been enumerating some of the challenges being faced by the hospital. Um, I'm told that uh, Minta Kando is back on the line. Mr. Kando, your committee, the Health Committee of Parliament, is expected to ensure that some of these health facilities, especially teaching hospitals that serve a large number of uh, constituents, must be in good shape. What has your committee been doing all this well. Right, I think we've lost uh, Minta Kando there. Uh, we will try and get him back again on the line, but let's still stick with health issues. Hello, Mr. Kando, can you hear me? Yeah, good morning. Right, so I'm asking what the Committee of Health in Parliament has been doing all this well uh, because we know your job is to ensure some of these health facilities are in good shape. So what have you been doing all this well for, uh, for us to be witnessing uh, some of these challenges in these hospitals? <laughs> the, the job of Parliament or the committee on parliamentary select committee on health is not for the day to day running of the hospital. We are there for one approval of facilities or loans to make sure that hospitals are in good shape. We are there for legislation of these hospitals. And of course, we are there as and when issues come up to try to see what we can do about these things. But mm -hmm. the issue at hand is not inflicted by this government. And I guess we are talking about why we have limited space as conformity to this process, isn't it? Isn't it? True. Yes, it's a self inflicted one. There are two main approaches. We must be dealing with assets. And then, apart from the assets, we have to be able to equip our health facility with the necessary uh, medical equipment. Now the answer, due to the strategic position of confinement specific hospitals, it is expected that pressure will come to bear on them. So if you could recall, His Excellency Jamzaman Mohammed administration made a test to reduce the pressure on compromises by contracting a number of health facilities in that environment. So you talk about the Wea, you talk about the Fazi, you talk about Kumawu, you talk about Kobina. So if you complete this major hospital to be in the ankle, it will automatically reduce the pressure on compromises. That is the idea. While you are looking at expanding Kompanochi, renovating Kompanochi, you are looking at completing these health facilities within the entry to break down the pressure on Kompanochi. And your guess is as good as mine, for the past seven to eight good years, these health facilities, the construction of these health facilities, have come to a halt. You know, and even though they already existing one, for example, even if there is space in Kompanochi and dialysis machines are not working and you are right to Kompanochi, you may get a bed, but you may not get a dialysis machine. You go to a health facility and there are no imaging facilities or equipment. These are the problems and it is the responsibility of the government, the executive, to invest in the air sector. I'll give you another example. I'm just coming from Tamar Hospital. The responsibility of we, the members of parliament, is for government to see the need that, look, let's go and construct a hospital at Tamar. So the government brings a facility to parliament, then we approve the facility, then the government goes ahead and to build. Now, from where I am coming from, four years, the president went to Samar to cut a thought, cut a thought for the commencement of Samar Digital Hospital in August 2020. We are, and we approved the loan in March 2020. 
and we are in March 2024. Yes, absolutely nothing is happening on the side. So please, yes, we have a role to play, but we are not a spending of this. And it's our responsibility to bring to attention, to bring to form, or the front banner, what the people need. And we do our best. If you have monitored the, uh, the, the Parliamentary Select Committee on Health carefully, I don't think that we have been quiet uh, in the in the in the health sector. So how I do you intend to get the ministry, the health ministry, to actually deal with some of these challenges? As you yourself have not. heard the PR of of Kath and you've seen visuals, it's really damning. I didn't hear the question. How I'm, do we do what? I'm saying, how do you intend to get the health ministry to actually deal with uh, these challenges? Yes. So quite recently, about two, three, four days ago. I had my chance to take the the sooner and ask your 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 your, your rest in parliament. I showed some of the sick hospitals on the floor of the house. That is the way we can get them to do the right thing. But these are, I mean, people who don't really care. They don't care. If you have any responsible government in place. Even after airing this news, somebody must be, I mean, somebody must be answering some questions. The president or the vice president or the minister must quickly find out what is happening and must send some of the issues. I look, you people, join, join me. You need a document you want to take hospitals. Go back to those hospitals if anything at all has been done. Go back to the country we find ourselves in. So we will, we will continue to do our best. Two some of these interviews, two questions, and inviting the minister responsible for health to appear before the house. Unfortunately, um, there have been some reshuffle, and the new one has not been cleared to appear before us. But rather than when uh, he's cleared, we will we, we tell you about that, please. Grateful for your time. Governor Minta Kando is ranking member on Parliament's Health Committee. Let's stick with health because Ghana's struggling healthcare system is forcing patients with essential medical conditions to seek advanced treatment outside the country, which is costing the millions of cities. Despite the increased population and demand for health care, many public and private health facilities are incapacitated by the lack of staff and equipment, hindering a range of services offered. General Manager of Hope Exchange Medical Center that Dominico Sekothi has been decrying the lack of sophisticated medical equipment in the health sector to remedy certain health conditions. Healthcare services in Ghana are still best as many health facilities become unaffordable, render poor quality services and lack medical gear. This common trend only favors a selected few privileged Ghanaians who are able to travel abroad to seek refined health care. The 135 Capacity Hope Exchange Medical Center recorded over 53,000 patients last year, despite the huge numbers catered for by the institution. General Manager Dominic Osei Kufi is emphasizing the need for expansion of services, more staff, and increased equipment. But the hospital is expanding. The hospital is expanding. We need staff residents. We need to uh, bring more clinics. Uh, that is, uh, uh, add more services to what we are doing. And as patients come in, you also need more equipment. So uh, I just want to appeal to the, the, the people of Ghana, those who have, let them also see what they can give in terms of health care to the people of Ghana. Dominic Osei made these comments during a visit by the president of Malta, George Villa, to the facility established by a Maltese non-governmental organization. The visit comes as the Moti government seeks to improve its health corporations between Ghana. Dominic Osei wants support from both local institutions and individuals to contribute more to improving the health sector. I want, just want to encourage our, the, the people of Ghana, especially those who have also see how best they can promote the health sector. This whole project is the initiative of a Maltese. He doesn't live in Ghana. So if somebody who is not a Ghanaian has been so generous taking such initiative and having such a facility for the people of Ghana. Then I think that in Ghana, what are, are we also doing? 
the motor president inspected the facility wards, including the recently inaugurated e-learning laboratory at the facility. He assures of the committed efforts of the Maltese to contribute to improving health care in Ghana. who do not have access to medical care, look for the basics, like emergencies, blood examinations, infections, gynecology, and things like that. So thank you very much for coming up with this idea. Obviously, on behalf of the multi speaker, I also thank the multi speaker for all having been so generous over all these years, and I think and I wish that they should carry on helping this very important initiative. If they knew more about it, I can assure you that we'll be having more and more funding. Because even I, coming here for the first time, I'm impressed that this is something which is really, really giving a huge social service to the people in the city. So the Maltese president is on a three-day visit to Ghana. Reporting for joining is Clinton, Yeboah. The St. Ignatius of Loyola SHS in Wa in the Upper West region has been temporarily closed down after fire destroyed its multi-purpose dining hall complex. The fire which started during the wee hours of Saturday burned many of the newly built 900 desk dining tables and set of benches and assorted food items. Join us as Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam has more. The blistering river of fire, according to an eyewitness, started around 3 a.m. on Saturday and passed of the 1,500 seater multi papers into asses and also weakened the concrete walls and gables. The head prefect ran bank at my door. I woke up, I asked, he said he was the head prefect that our dining hall was in flames. I, I, I ran out and from my residence I could see the entire place in flames. So that was when I immediately rushed for my phone and started calling fire service. I called their main line, national line. It was barely nothing was happening. So I quickly recorded a piece of uh, uh, SOS message and posted on various platforms, hoping that somebody would stumble upon it and then uh, uh, call them. Personnel of the Ghana National Fire Service from Muchao were called into action. They made it to the St. Ignatius of Layula, or better known as La Cetuolo Senior High School, but were unable to salvage the situation. The Peter Apostle Regional Commander of the Ghana National Fire Service, DO2, Adam Sisaku, explained to a worried Apostle Regional Minister, Dr. Fiz Bin Sali, who came to assess the extent of damage caused by the fire. And normally, in any situation when we are dealing with disaster fire product, there's a, a movement, the incipient state, how the fire starts. Then it goes to group state. Then from the group state, it moves to full group state. And then full group state, that is why the state where everything is supposed to be burning, is burning. So for the arrival of the Wichel to the fire scene, it was in the full group state. So everything that that building was supposed to be burned. Mm -hmm. got its which burned. Do they have a tender? Which all have a tender. Okay. And the tender is fashioned up to the Asian Commission. Okay. So when they come in with this situation, we're back up for a while. You know the Ghana yeah, 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 yeah. uh, It's a serious situation. Uh, it's beyond what I anticipated when I left war. And Nothing can be done about this structure. With my layman's eye, the only thing we can do to it is to pull it down. That is my observation. And uh, haven't gone around during the week. The regional get fun consultant will come and then have a look at the facility 
in them is taken up from them. Headmaster of the school, Emmanuel Banonwe, disclosed that they have lost several items valued at several thousands of Ghana cities. Items at the store. Mace, 24 bucks. Macram, 15 cartons. Vegetable oil, 24 cans. Palm oil, uh, uh, a gallon. A concrete, two bucks. A dry okro, one bag. Salt, one bag. Margarine, one bucket. Student desk in there, 900 pieces. Then down whole tables and set of benches, 500. Then public addresses, a whole set. We have musical instruments, piano, organ, set of drums, and all those musical uh, uh, gadgets that we normally need to entertain uh, students. The students are already feeling the pinch of the excruciating pain caused by the inferno. They are yet to know it cause. Head prefect of the school held a nanang, painted a mental picture of what they are going to lose in the absence of the multi-purpose dining hall. The dining hall seeks to be the main engine of the school because everything happens there. This day, in fact, the destruction of this hall is like um, just in the bend down of the parliament house in Ghana right now. Because that's where everything happens. Dining is even a multi-purpose hall. Right now, that's where we write exams. The form ones were to continue their exams tomorrow, and here is the case that they cannot continue their exams. We're also supposed to be in school to, up to, uh, to the 28th, and that time we have learned something. But here is the case that we are going home. Most of us won't get a time to learn. The school for now has simply been closed down to enable them and they take investigation to ascertain the cause of the fire and also put in place measures for the return of the students. Go home, rest, and after some time, we will call you. With regard to the structure, I want to assure you that the government of His Excellency Nana Adodankwe Pufado will put the structure in place in a record time. That I can assure you. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam, last year to Olu. In the central region, Majority Leader Alexander Afenyomunakeng is asking supporters of the various political parties not to see the opposing sides as their enemies and resort to violence with the slightest disagreement. According to him, party supporters should not be deceived by the disagreements they see in Parliament because they constitute only 1% of what happens in Parliament. The Futu MP was speaking at the speech and prize given day at the Agri Memorial Senior High School in Cape Coast. The majority leader, Alexander Kwamina Fenyomarkin, in his speech at the speech and prize giving day at the school, emphasized the need for party supporters to guard against violence, especially before, during, and after the impending national elections. According to him, politicians are not enemies, and what usually happens in the Chamber of Parliament are mostly achieved by consensus. This year is an election year. We always a duty to Mother Ghana to engage in positive debates. Let's discuss the issues that will transform our nation. Fortunately for us as a country, we have two main political parties, the NDC and the MPP. Both parties have had the opportunity to govern this country. Let the NDC bring their vision on. Listen and find out what they want to do. Let the MPP bring its vision on. Listen and see how better they can make Ghana and make your decision. It is not about the insult. It is not about name calling. It's not about the extremist views. It is about the future of our country. <coughs> and let me tell you, in case you don't know, in that chamber of parliament, the MPs don't fight to rule. In that chamber of parliament, we are not at each other's throat. The little noise you hear constitutes less than 1% of 
the things we do. 99% of the issues, we agree to them by consensus. So please don't be misled. Headmistress of the school, Kate Anan Wilberforce, called for a collective effort in shaping the future of the students. She, however, reviewed some disturbing developments in the school and implored parents to support the school to stem them out. We therefore challenged ourselves to study the aptitude of, other, of our students and concluded, for example, that some were practical-minded people who were visual, kinesthetic, or musical intelligent and therefore needed to see vivid images or needed to touch what they learn in order to assimilate the subject matter. We therefore made a passionate appeal for projectors to be used in each class to aid teaching and learning. Having laid out these wonderful gestures above, permit me to say, however, that the distracting behavior of some students who despite the rules insist on bringing phones to school and thus go around destroying sockets in their quest to charge their cell phones. Not only do they undermine the gallant efforts of old students, but they demonstrate a disturbing deficit of character by wantonly destroying a lot of the sockets provided, provided by their, uh, for their own education. The Amosa 1999 year group donated an ultra-modern entrance and security gate to the school to enhance the school's overall security ecosystem. The majority leader commissioned the project. On your election headquarters, NDC flag bearer John Ramani Mahama says the interests of teachers and women will be upheld with the nomination of Professor Nana Jenopokwajeman as his running mate because she belongs to both sex. The NDC flag bearer last week outdoored the former vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast as his running mate for the second time. Commenting on his choice as he trawled the Upper West region, Mr. Mahama said he is confident the country will have its first female vice president after the 2024 election. Elections. He was speaking at Boussier as part of the Building Ghana tour. And then also, I want to thank all the teachers of Ghana. As you know, yesterday I named my running mate, Professor Nana Jen Opokwajiman, who has been a long time teacher. Many students have passed through her hands. And she has also been Minister of Education before. And so she is one of you. And so I'm sure that you have a representative and a friend in the highest uh, office of the land, that is the presidency. And I'm sure she will take care of your interests and do the things that would improve the education sector. And the teaching profession. Well, I'm happy to that today is International Women's Day and we've been able to present to the women of Ghana for the second time. We did it in 2020. We're not successful. But this time, I know we're going to be successful. We are presenting to the women of Ghana. We are presenting to the women of Ghana a female running mate. And I'm sure that come 7 January 2025, we shall swear in a female vice president for the first time in Ghana's history. Well, the flag bearer of the NDC, John Romani Mahama, will today commence a two-day tour of the Greater Accra region. It is the 14th region so far visited under the NDC's building Ghana tour. The former president seeking to stage a comeback to power uh, is gathering opinions of the electorate to feed into the party's manifesto for the 2024 general elections. Nanaya Ojima is with the former president. He joins us with more. Nanaya Ojima, where uh, uh, are you uh, guys? I mean, I mean the NDC flag bearer uh, and his team. Where are they right now, and what has he been telling the people? A few minutes ago, the first meeting for the Greater Accra Region commenced, and the former president John Dramani Mahama is meeting some party executives of 
the National Democratic Congress. Uh, presently, he's in a meeting with uh, regional executives and also executives from the various constituencies of the country. And this meeting they call entry meeting, and it's been repeated in every region that the building Ghana saw so far uh, has made a stop in these regions. So after the meeting, uh, the former president will proceed to the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs. But he will, before that, he will make a drive through the Dodoa at the Dodoa market and make the stop, the next stop at the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs. The chiefs will get the opportunity to put their concerns before the former president. And these concerns, as he has been saying, will feed into the party manifesto for the 2024 general elections. And the former president will also address the chiefs and the mainstream. Um, these, these meetings are also being repeated in Volta region. There was a similar meeting like that. In the Upper East region, there was a similar meeting. In Greater Accra, this meeting is also being repeated. From there, he will move straight to Abu Sokai, where he will be meeting some traders and spare parts dealers in a town hall meeting. The traders and spare parts dealers will get the opportunity to level their concerns before him. Same was done at the Kumase Swami magazine. So it's been repeated here in the Greater Accra region, region and these um, concerns will feed into the party manifesto as um, has been said already. So the Greater Accra region, uh, the, the former president will stay here for two days. From the Greater Accra region, he traverse straight into the OT region, which will be the 15th region for the NDC building Ghana tour to visit as they take opinions of the public. The former president, who is also flag bearer for the NDC for the 2024 elections, will bring you more as and when we get it in our subsequent bulletins. Taking us to a break on Joy News Desk when we return this business. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Oil marketing company Petros Organa has empowered its female staff to mark the International Women's Day with the Women in Leadership Conference. According to Chief Executive Officer Michael Bosombill, the conference was to build the leadership capabilities of its female staff to prepare them for future leadership roles. He says that this strategy is critical for the success and sustainability of the company. The 2024 edition of the Women in Leadership Conference by the Petrosol Women Network was on the theme Investing in Women, Energizing for the Future. In an interview with Joy Business, the CEO of Petrosol Ghana, Michael Bozumbil, says the company is dedicated to empowering its female staff for future leadership roles. And right from the beginning, when we, we began operating as a company, it's been a conscious effort to encourage the growth of you know, uh, female uh, leaders in the company. And we have invested you know, in building their capacity because we know the challenges that the female you know, uh, staff face, especially in a very difficult and male-dominated sector like the energy sector. And we are glad that um, as a company with over 500 employees, about 46% of that number, you know, constitutes the female staff working across the country. But what is remarkable, you know, uh, for us is that this year marks our 10th anniversary. And, and so we thought that it was important that we celebrate our female staff they've done over the years, working tirelessly, combining uh, their roles uh, at home with the demands of the corporate world and excelling, for me, that is a story worth celebrating. Deputy Chief Executive of the National Petroleum Authority, Linda Asante, urged women to develop their networking skills. I mean, the perception out there is that women, we are our own enemies. And I, I, I disagree with that perception because I, for one, have about 50 girls I'm mentoring. And I'm sure other women that I know who attended the, the conference are doing something similar. I'm only urging our ladies and the girls out there should reach out to people that they think have made it to the glass ceiling 
people have impacted their community and their workplace who are leading. Reach out to them and find out how they made it. It's all about researching and knowing who to contact and what network you should join. I mean, there are a lot of peer reviews that you can join. So I just want to urge our young ladies upcoming and even the grown-ups who don't know how to network to start doing that because it's very important. I'm here because of the network that I built when I was in the university. Some key female workers were recognized and awarded for their dedication and loyalty to the Petrosol Ghana brand. Now, Republic Bank Ghana PLC says it remains committed to expanding its mortgage banking services to reach more customers in the Ashanti region and northern parts of the country. The bank has established a mortgage hub in the Ashanti region with hopes of becoming a one-stop desk for affordable and accessible home ownership to customers and prospects. The bank is also extending its ultra-low mortgage interest rates of less than 26% to the hub as part of its seven packages to customers to bridge the housing deficit in Ghana. There's more in this report. Reports suggest that Ghana's housing deficit stands at 1.8 million units as of 2021, although a 33% reduction from figures in 2010, the deficit is regarded as the seven as many homes owing to financial constraints. Republic Bank Ghana PLC is extending its property loan acquisition in the fast-growing mortgage business to the middle and northern sectors of the country. In 2023, the bank introduced the ultra-low mortgage interest rate campaign as an intervention to the hikes in interest rates, forest rate volatility and other factors affecting home purchase. Dan Ajete Mohenu is the head of mortgage banking and customer experience at Republic Bank. We, we have about seven um, mortgage products that we are showcasing um, at the hub um, for someone who wants to purchase a completed house, for someone who wants equity release in an existing property, for um, one who wants to complete their um, building, they've started their project, they are locked up at a point and they need money to complete. We are going to showcase our home completion mortgage to them. For people who also have houses and they want to go um, do some sort of expansion or renovation, there's also a product for them. Um, we also have the pension back mortgage. Since its inception in 1990, the bank has been at the forefront of the mortgage business. As a home finance company, the financial institution is hoping to support government to bridge the housing deficit in the country. Leila Pencil is a communications manager of the bank. We've been in mortgage financing for over 35 years. And one of our focuses has been to do that work that gives government some assurance that the people of Ghana can also own their own properties. We all know how wide the deficit is with home um, ownership in Ghana. So Republic Bank, our business has always been to help government bridge that gap. And one of the products we have in collaboration with government is NHF. That's a government project that gives you the opportunity to own your first home with probably your pensions or even your own earnings. Patrons of mortgage packages of the bank shared benefits gained. When I moved to my current place, I told myself, you no, know, looking at the rent I'm paying and the mortgage repayment, I would rather go for a pensions back mortgage because I'm already in the pensions industry. A mortgage comes with a hazard. This hazard needs to be what financed through what insurance. So we come in to support both sides, that is the bank and then the owner of the property. Their product in terms of getting us customers to buy uh, the houses that we build. So it's not like we are out there doing marketing for ourselves, but the bank is the one doing all these marketing. It makes a very, very smooth. We've done about three uh, projects with them and it's, it's gone smoothly. Other places we've gone, the products are quite cumbersome with them. It's smart and it's customers are not complaining. That's what we all want. For Jojo News, my name is Emmanuel Bright Kweku. And that's it for this segment. The news returns after the break.
The Ghana Water Company Limited in the central region has revealed the company has had to reduce production by 30% due to severe pollution of raw water caused by illegal mining activities. A visit to the Citra Hemang plant revealed that Galamse activities have narrowed the intake canal, muddied the water and clogged up the sum of plant, significantly reducing the flow of water to the plant. Speaking at a dredging exercise at the plant intake to address the acute water shortage affecting parts of the region, the Central Regional Chief Manager of Ghana Water Company Limited, Seth Erika Tiapa, indicated the situation had also significantly increased the cost of production. This is one of uh, our biggest plants. Uh, it supplies uh, the environs of Elmina and sometimes it helps with even Cape Coast South and then Cape Coast North. Uh, today we are having two main exercises here. One is the dredging of the um, sur area surrounding the intake and then also the manual desilting of the intake zone. So you see behind us here we have the dredger that is trying to, is removing silt accumulated over the months as a result of Galamse at the intake canal. So first of all, when a plant is designed, a design, we consider the, the, the nature of the raw water. Uh, most of the time, the, some of the things we consider is the color and the turbidity. So I think this plant was designed with a turbidity of about 30. NT5, 500 NTU. Yes, and carrying it last week, we got as much as I think 7,500. So you can see that almost, almost water that cannot be treated. It's almost water that cannot be treated. Uh, but what are we doing? Now we have to use more potent chemicals, very exorbitant uh, prices. I think four, three, three to four times more expensive. Yeah, than, than the conventional alum that we use. So these days you will hear of polymer or polyelectrolytes, more potent but very expensive chemicals. So if we had not gotten that, probably we wouldn't even have water. That is one. Two, because of the nature of the water, we have cut down production by 30% so that we can have time to treat the very poor or bad water we have. And that's how we wrap up News Desk this morning. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Log on to myjohnline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. See you again at 12.